Baron and I have been on a road show about around Maine and Vermont, so we're having a blast. I get to every day um, we read here a new chapter from Baron from this book. So I'm starting out, and a lot of people in Maine know me, or in my hometown know me as an acupuncturist and as a um, as a poet. So I thought I'd create this slideshow that would lead you on how I moved from writing poetry to how a memoir um, accosted me and demanded to be written. So I started, I spent a lot of time on islands and living 30 years in Maine, it's an obvious thing to be moved to write poetry. Um, I wrote a lot about what it's like living in a small town, about raising kids, about just the intimacy of, of the depth of connections that you make in a small town. Um, I was honored to become a poet laureate of Belfast, which we, we have a particular style of dressing for certain events. And, um, and this is three of, of the many poets laureate. We also learned how to say it's not poet laureates, but it's poets laureate, which was a, a cool thing to learn. Um, I also spent time out on Maine Islands, and I collaborated with a remarkable painter-photographer, and I spent time on Great Spruce Head Island and um, Bear Island, writing poems um, that paired up with his work. Um, but then when my daughter, my youngest, was about to leave home and I was facing an empty nest, I thought, well, what do I do? Well, start an MFA. Um, so I started at Stone Coast, and it was actually Baron who inspired me to start a master's in creative writing. I wanted to take my poetry deeper. I've been a self-taught poet, and had just read extensively for decades, and had learned to write. And But I thought, I want to learn more of the skill. And I've learned a lot from Baron in books and from mentoring. But he said, jump in there and just really get to work. And these are some of the... Um, the really um, potent moments of guidance from Barron about um, how to write poetry, and little did I know that I would carry into writing prose. One of my favorites is when you're working on a poem and you think it's done, it's like to stay longer, dwell, linger, stay, just stay there longer. Um, don't leave too soon. Wait to see what else is there. You're ready to see how deep, big and deep the lake is. And little did I know how big and deep the lake of what I would start working on would be. And I had many other remarkable mentors at Stone Coast and after. So one of the first things that I was writing poetry for about a term and a half, and I read a, an essay by an African-American poet, Major Jackson. And this essay was called The Mystifying Silence. And I'll read this. The mystifying silence around race highlights white American poets' unsettling and conspicuous unresponsiveness and ambivalence towards a very important aspect of social life in America. And I realized I'd been living in Maine. I'd been writing about my present life, but I, I grew up on the Mason-Dixon line in southern Ohio. I, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and I had left that part of my life behind. It hadn't really written about that time in my life, and that this essay just catapulted me into all these memories of my childhood, of growing up with a black woman who took care of us when a new baby would come, of my black first boyfriend who was black, and what it was like in a, being the first biracial couple in our high school that year. And it was just a lot was stirred up, which started me thinking more about my up, up, um, my growing up in Ohio that I hadn't been that thinking about being immersed in my life in Maine. <coughs> the other thing that stimulated me moving from poetry to memoir is, um, ironically, it was heart, heart surgery. I had had chronic um, atrial fibrillation since my teens which my dad had also had. And I had a procedure to go in and scar and burn different parts of my heart so it wouldn't keep misfiring. And my fear before this procedure was that I would lose poetry, and I did. It was, there was a way that poetry 
never came back, but what came instead was a steady stream of memories. And I have a commitment to, when words come or lines come, I have a commitment to writing them down. Like last night at three in the morning, I started having, it was like, oh shoot, I have to get up and to write a couple of pages. But I have this commitment, I don't want to, I have bad memory, I don't want to lose them. So poetry just stepped aside, but this stream of memory, and I just started writing and writing these pieces that kept coming to me. I was in the vividness of being seven and remembering having to jump on my bed so that the witch under my bed wouldn't grab my ankle. I hadn't remembered that for a very long time. Um, or I remember turning the house upside down in my mind as a kid lying in bed when you're waiting to go to sleep and it takes a long time. And I imagined walking around the house on the ceiling. Um, it was that degree of intimacy of memory that started coming. And I wrote for the next two and a half years just every memory that I could remember from my childhood, teens, 20s, 30s that had to do with that time of my growing up. And then Baron said, when you're all done with this big mess, your first draft, um, I have an editor that you can work with, and she'll help you sort it out to see what's vital and alive in it. So I worked with her, and she said, what this is really about is the energy between you and your dad, who is a modern architect. And it's really a book about modernism and growing up in a glass house. And and it's so funny to think that that took me by surprise, but it was like, oh, that's the thing that ties this together. So I started as, I was a child of modernism. I started very early in a womb chair by, designed by Saarinen. And um, how many of you grew up with 60s modern furniture? So when you grow up with modern furniture, you're out, you know the name of the designer of the furniture your life becomes an aesthetic event with this, an aesthetic kind of self-consciousness. So um, I adored my father and I adored the way he talked about architecture. And the first time I experienced living in a modern building was we spent a week on a cottage on Nantucket that my father had designed. And I'll read you a little bit from the book. On Nantucket, I woke to the breathing of the waves sliding across the sand in a house where everything felt fresh and cool. In 1952, my father had designed for Ruth and Bob the first upside-down modern beach house on Nantucket. The living room was on the second floor, high above the dunes, while the bedrooms on the ground floor were quiet and shady, tucked in between the dunes, surrounded by windswept, tall, dry grasses. Under wooden ceilings, we leaned into a white couch while the sound of the waves smoothed us. Back in Cincinnati, in our 1860s Victorian house, our, house was, our life was confined by hallways, French doors, a formal dining room with a chandelier, a library with a medieval paneled ceiling, bookcases behind glass doors, a pantry, a back kitchen. There, my father's voice boomed with excitement when he talked about modern architecture. As a child, I knew there was an exciting time coming when no one would build cluttered, decorated buildings anymore. Everything would be designed with clean, elegant lines. I listened closely to my father. Modern was truth and simplicity, and it followed rules. When we stayed at the house on Nantucket, I knew we were living in the modern, where the roof lifted up like a wing to glide over the long beach below. So um, one of the things when I went to my dad's office is um, I would go into the drafting room where the architects and the co-op students were drawing up plans. And I would also go into my dad's office and look at his books of des designs and buildings by Le Corbusier. But I'll, I'll describe a little bit of what it was like being at their office. Over the years, I absorbed their language of special words clear story, cantilever, reinforced, transparent. I loved the names of architects they murmured reverently, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Alvar Alto, and my father's favorite, Le Corbusier. His white books of complete 
Olive's complete works were placed prominently on a bookshelf next to my father's desk in his private office. I'd make a beeline to sit on the metal Victoria chair next to Corbu's books. I'd turn pages in a book looking at old photographs of white buildings and drawings. My father would pause between phone calls to stand next to me, pointing to a photograph or a drawing, admiring lines of a, a line of windows or a curving roof garden. I listened carefully, intent on becoming his finest student. When I was eight, I showed my father my favorite, a house that looked like a sculpture of light and shadow set in a meadow, Villa Savoie near the town of Poissy. So I went on to be, my father's architecture was really influenced by this building. This building came to have a presence in my life. So by eighth grade in French class, when we had to have an end of the year project, and some kids built the Eiffel Tower with toothpicks, and other people did made um, fondue, my dad and I built a professional architectural model of the Villa Savoie of Poissy. So I learned it from the inside out. and. That was part of how I learned to read drawings and visualize interior spaces. It was an extraordinary education. And then when I was 19 and went to live in France, one of the first things I did was to go on a pilgrimage to this building, which is in my memoir. All right, so, um, so I continued growing up in a city where my father's modern buildings were part of the language of the city, the Cincinnati Public Library with this beautiful undulating serpentine wall. This was a friend of ours house and but we lived in this old fashioned house, but eventually we started building and built a beautiful modern glass house. But when I started working on what I wanted to do in terms of a memoir, I realized I needed to do a number of different things. And the first story was the family story. What was it to be an adoring daughter of a brilliant architect who went crazy? And what were the, what contributed to that? And how did that happen? And how did that affect our family? So that was one layer of the story that I was trying to put together. The next part of the story was what happened to us when we built and designed and landscaped for seven years of my life, this house. This is years later after it's all blended in. It was a bulldozed field with a sort of a raw um, blank slate set in the middle, and we grew up there. One of the things when I was working with Baron as a mentor, he said, show me the house. Show me what it was like to live there. What? How did it affect you? How did living in a modern house affect you as compared to your friends living in all different other kinds of houses? So I got to really explore the effect of architecture on a child's psyche and growing up there. So that's another layer of what I was trying to bring together in this memoir. And then it was the mid-late 60s and, since then, and the riots of 67 that went across, that just kept exploding across the country and the riots were particularly devastating in, the, in Cincinnati. And I wrote a chapter about how the how the riots affected <clears throat> my father, <clears throat> sorry, whose office was across the street from an area where there were buildings exploding and tanks going down the road. Um, and I'll read just a little bit of that. The riots sparked a fury in my father. The modernist radical would now pit himself against the new revolutionaries. Blacks fighting for jobs and justice, women fighting for their voice, and long-haired anti-war protesters setting out to bring down the old order. He did not realize he was pitting himself against his own wife and children, who almost inevitably, each in their own way, would be joining the revolution. So the, the riots and then the anti-war protests and just revolutionized each of us in our own way and our family. So I needed to bring in those layers of social history. <clears throat> And then there was a, the story of my dad's last major building, which was a 27-story mirror glass dormitory on the University of Cincinnati campus that became, the, um, it became a symbol of the enemy for, on the UC campus. Um, 
even though it seemed like it would be really cool, these glass walls and looking at this great view, it was so out of proportion with the community and the buildings and students didn't want, they wanted to live in funky apartments off campus. They didn't want to live with 1,700 other students and eat in a dining room with 3,000 students. And from the moment this building opened in the fall of 1971, the kids went crazy in this building. There was, it was famous for all night partying, for robberies, for rape, and then it started acts of arson. And really good, nice Ohio kids started setting fires. And they would like put papers together and send them down the garbage chute, getting smoke and fire going through the building. They would fill up garbage cans full of paper and set them on fire and it would get a bullet board going on fire. By the end, it was sometimes four to five acts of arson a week. The building ended up being closed after 11 years. It was pretty wrecked. It was left like this empty hulk for nine years over the campus. And then in 1991, uh, it was imploded. Let me quick show you. I'm sure. So I'm going to just go back. So telling the story of this building was another major theme line because it was, it was part of what escalated my father going nuts. It was besides everything else, the battle for this building just put him over the edge. His being bipolar and being embattled year after year on this building and then watching what happened to it and accusations and that it wasn't safe and that it was just, it, um, the impact of my father's battle seriously impacted our family. So what you do next when you're working on a memoir is you get back and you start doing research. And I started rereading essays on modernism and architecture and sort of re-immersing in myself in that language. And I realized I had learned so much as a kid, being my dad's student and going to buildings. And I realized it was a language that I'd set aside, but I love the principles and the history of modern architecture and art and sculpture. And it was sort of this return to something that I had forgotten about. I also returned to Cincinnati for the first time since my dad had died in 1994. And I fell in love with the city again. And I had this great time staying with cousins and exploring parts of the city and bringing the vividness of the city into the memoir. And um, it ended up taking 10 years from the start from my heart surgery to the point of bringing out my book this last spring. And there are lots of pauses. There's the process of trying to get published. But it's good to have something take a while because it keeps deepening and it keeps going to deeper layers. And I kept, as Barron's, the deep, the lake kept getting deeper and I kept bringing in more depth to it. And it was not until about the last year before I got the, before the book was published that I realized the title, it, I always thought it was a memoir of an architect's daughter, but I realized the title was really Implosion. And it was about the implosion of this building, it was the implosion of the culture, it was the implosion of my family and my father. And it takes a while to listen long enough to discover what a, a story is really about and to look at your own life from that perspective to discover what's really happening that when you live through it, you don't quite see. And it was a profound experience writing this, and I felt like one of the magical things was in writing it and returning into memory and to bringing this book together, it was like I lifted it out of me and I passed it on. Sometimes people ask me about something that happened in my childhood, and I go, well, there's a chapter about that. So there it is, the implosion. I'll read you the description of the implosion. Sander Hall took seven seconds to fall. Young voices cheered what might no longer be cheered. A chilling first practice in watching a modern glass sheathed building shudder and wobble like a woman fainting or shot still managing to keep her dignity as she stayed upright. She sank to her knees before vanishing in a tsunami of dust that pursued the onlookers. Online, you can play and replay four screens showing the single largest implosion in the Western Hemisphere. 520 pounds of dynamite carefully placed, six months to plan, 
seconds to fall. On the houseboat, my father and the chief engineer for this building waited with champagne and glasses to, ready to toast. White dust puffed gossamer between deep green hills where the tower had held the view for 20 years. My father said over the phone to me a week later, good riddance. His voice still defiant. Interviews in the paper quoted him saying, I still believe it was a perfect building. Even with all those fires set, a student never died in it. Yet I imagined him looking down, tracing his foot along a seam on the deck, muttering quietly, it's a terrible thing to outlive your buildings. Thank you. to our lives as we continue to live under the aegis of machines and speed, the hallmarks of modern times. Each legend is at once real as a lived life and imaginative in the sense that something larger and deeper is occurring, something like a vision, something much more than a set of facts. The lives are speaking. My task has been to listen and to write, much like what Elizabeth just said about listening. The people I've written about are Rosa Parks, Hannah Arendt, James Jesus Angleton. If you don't know that name, he was head of counterintelligence for the CIA in the 50s and 60s. Philip Berrigan, George F. Kennan, George Harrison, Miles Davis, Audrey Hepburn, Roland de Kooning, Richard Yates, and Anita O'Day. Uh, today I'm going to read from the piece about Rosa Parks. Where it started was uncertain. There was Africa, there were the ships, there was the auction block. Twelve bucks for sale, ages 12 to 20, and two wenches. There were thousands of wounds available to the master and his sons. There was the dinner table, past the bread, past the butter, past the Negroes who are as much our property as the bread and butter, past the complaints about how shiftless they are, past the complacency that enables us to sit here and not think twice. Past Senators Sparkman and Hill and their stentorian predecessors. Past the ice and water. Past the state's rights. Past this damned heat so it leaves the room. Past the Bible that sanctions slavery. Past those biscuits that Aunt Mary made. She makes the best biscuits. Past the filibuster. Past the birthright that is fate, born mewling and shrieking past the whip, past the river Jordan, past the occasional kindness, past the way of life, past the mistress of the house staring into a disconsolate mirror. Behind the path to the cabins, behind the preacher's sermon, behind the voices raised to heaven, behind the woman struggling with humiliation, indignity, and viciousness, a Montgomery, Alabama public transit bus heaved into sight 
with its human freight, white and black, coming home from work. They sat in their designated areas, whites up front, blacks in the middle, until more whites appeared when they had to move to the rear of the bus, which was the black area. If whites needed a seat, the driver would tell a black person to move. That was the law. The driver was an officer of the law and carried a gun. Everyone had to respect the law. If people did not respect the law, the world as Montgomery knew it would end. There is that weight of how things are here. Everyone is born into that weight, and that weight becomes part of who a person is. The weight can be favorable on account of your skin color, or not favorable. The weight is larger than just one person. So any one voice is more than one person speaking. Everything concerns the weight, especially when the weight becomes a code. There were water fountains for white and colored, but the colored fountain did not have colored water. Colored meant people. It wasn't, however, just the physical indignities to say nothing of cruelties, but the mental ones that made the weight so vast. The weight was like one big mind that went everywhere, every moment, and never slept. The weight was a power that could strike at any time. You could be minding your own business, but you had no own business. The weight owned your thoughts, or at least tried to. A child was bound to ask about why she couldn't go up to a certain fountain but had to use another one. A child was bound to say that it made no sense and the adult was bound to look at the child and wonder how to explain. The adult was bound to wonder why she or he brought the child into a world filled with such soul-killing prohibitions. Perhaps the adult gripped the child's hand a bit more tightly and said, that's the way it is. Perhaps the child heard in the voice a regret that no smile could absolve. Perhaps that tight grip almost hurt. Everyone knew Rosa Parks was a serious, dignified Christian woman. A serious, dignified Christian woman who wasn't fit to take her own seat on a bus and stay there regardless of whoever else got on the bus. But everyone meant black folks, not those white folks to whom Rosa Parks was just another Negro to say nothing of the common epithet. She wasn't a real person, but the coordinates of a few centuries of bad history. Everyone had learned to live with that bad history. That was what the bus was about. Some people actually celebrated the history. They had their pride and let everyone know it. If only they had won that war. Others, the unreal Negroes, simply had to live with it take what they could, which was plenty in the way that being on the earth and sharing the earth with other people could be plenty. No pity need apply. But even the greatest vitality and love would have to move for the bus driver. A person, black or white, could wonder about what sort of God blessed the circumstances of history. A person could wonder what God saw if he saw anything. A person could wonder whether God was blind, loving and kind, no doubt, but blind. When the bus boycott began in Montgomery after Rosa's refusal to move and her arrest, very few white folks, most of whom presumably were churchgoers, stood up for the Negroes. There were some, like the woman who directed the library and who was vilified for her support, and who killed herself not long after. If you stepped out of line, you could pay a pariah's price. According to all manner of doctrine, people had free will despite the constraints people put on other people. Above that less than edifying spectacle, God resided in his appointed heaven. And Rosa had faith in that God, if not explicitly in that heaven. 
You needed the buttress of spirit to stand up to what was determined to belittle you. The Negro ministers called upon the buttress of God day and night, their exhortations filled and enlivened the mute air. But the librarian lady fell down. She was in a congregation of what may have seemed like one. The God of the white churches offered consolations that apparently were not for everyone. The librarian's demise might have been called a tragedy, but that word did not apply to history. That word came from some other ancient world, not an American one. Any little human life was just that, a little human leaf on the very big current of history, to say nothing of destiny. No one could see a leaf going down the Mississippi. You could see a person go under, or you heard about it, but plenty of people went under. Routinely, Negroes were murdered, and nothing was done about it. The lives of Negroes were more like weeds in the eyes of those who controlled history. You could pull a weed and throw it aside, and that was the end of it. Rosa Easley could have gone under, too. Rosa Easley could have been tossed aside. A diet of loathing makes for some thin people. There was much pep and cheering from the white folks, waving pennants at the sugar bowl and the cotton bowl, finding religion in football, acting like grown-up children. Imagine all the real trouble in the world, and there they were, people getting worked up about the game. The shouting, though, of the amplitude they prided themselves on never made the white folks any larger. They stayed thin. Their spirits starved, living on a ghostly animus. Their self-respect tied overtly or covertly to denying the right to the same schools and books. Their every motion and word a contrivance to which they held on to for unhappy, if accustomed life. Everything was feeding white folks, their banks and their land and their colleges and their companies but they remained lean and ever hungry. Out in, their, in the dark nights of their heads lurked the Negroes with their demands and their very being that spoke of suffering that never should have been allowed. It didn't matter how great the Virginian presidents were or how great the generals were in the war between the states. Some things weren't about greatness. They were about decency. The Negroes lived, of course, in unnoticeable circumstances, and a Negro woman was particularly unnoticeable. Then again, if they had noticed, no white person would have asked Rosa Parks what she thought or how she felt as she went about her life as a seamstress in Montgomery. Those would have been senseless questions. To move to the back of the bus was still to be chattel. You Negroes back there. It was to be faceless and nameless, lost in the slave hold of anonymity. So to insist that you had a voice that could say something more than yes, sir, was as crucial an assertion as a Negro and a woman to boot could make. Acquiescence and silence went together. The beauty of uprooting that acquiescence was that all those Bible-like speeches that emanated from the Negro churches in Montgomery, a torrent of eloquence as noteworthy as any unleashed by the orators and ministers of the 19th century, stemmed from a brief non-discussion on what purported to be a public bus. Mrs. Parks was not moving. There you had it. Ever since she was a child, Rosa Parks took herself seriously, the way any child raised by any responsible parent should be. One of her strengths lay in her refusing to let go of that seriousness. Inequality neither bemused nor frightened her. It was more like a taunt that never stopped ringing in her head and that was personal. Her life was singled out for the arcane and obvious practices of subordination. 
along with countless others. Her life would be discounted. What had the United States Constitution said? Three-fifths of a person. Negroes had forever refused to be such fractions. Before and after World War II, some of the discounted had protested. Some of them in Alabama, the heart of Dixie, had gotten in touch with the nefarious NAACP. Some of them had recognized the ultra-nefarious Communist Party as being a very rare group that was willing to take on murderous racism. What was the Cold War to someone who couldn't drink at a water fountain? What were all the foreign policy shenanigans and talk of the free world to someone who had to move to the back of the bus? How rarely, though, did a hypocrite see him or herself in the mirror? Maybe never. Red Tool, Commie Plant, Un-American. The headline shrilled, and in the way the headlines worked, a worthless accusation was as good as a fact. Some of the people trying to help Southern Negroes in the 1940s and whom Rosa had met were connected to the party. Such ties made her not someone advocating the overthrow of the government, but someone who wanted to vote for a government. Voting was something that older Negroes could only shake their heads about. The right had been there once, but it had gone. There were tests and rules, and for good measure, a tax. It was hard to imagine that right coming back as a right, not something a person had to beg for. But Rosa could imagine it quite well. She was one of those people who were not afraid to be stubbornly patient, full of quiet inner fire, who would knock on the insensate door again and again until someone answered, what do you want, the voice might say. More likely, get lost. Or the voice would only grunt, not even bothering with a no. What was there to talk about? Still she knocked, as when she traveled around Alabama in the 1940s, 40s, gathering information that she sent on to the National NAACP office about cases of violence against Negroes, murders, and rapes that went unpunished, or frame-ups that could result in a Negro's death penalty. All it took was a white woman's accusation about a Negro man, and hell could happen very quickly. The state of Alabama had its integrity to uphold. Schooled in contempt, she might have said, she who did not get the real schooling she hungered for. But there was no time to waste on grudges. She had seen how the impossibility of being in two places, black in a white world, led more than, white person, more, led more than one person to a violent death. Someone who could not take it anymore and struck back. There was no hope in striking back, but the impulse made sense. There was also good sense in having a gun in your house and being ready to use it. Everyone understood a gun. In a, in a nation where the federal government could not even pass an anti-lynching law, where opposition to such a law was, according to one southern senator, a cause worth dying for, a gun spoke many rough volumes. Ask the Klan. <coughs> asked the anonymous callers who called up Rosa's house and made promises about her death. How to get from here to there. How to get from the back to the front. How to get from talking to doing. How to get from typing endless letters and reports about endless wrongs endured by the powerless to achieving some measure of power. How to get from the nothingness that was impressed upon a person like some terrible duty to the somethingness that was a person. How to get from deference to assertion. How to get from a personal faith in God to a faith shared among sinners and for sinners. 
a faith that brought people together all the time, not just one day a week. I'm going to read a little more from this piece. A woman like Rosa Parks could believe in herself, but to believe in others, that was a task. Sentry stood up and smiled a belligerent grin which said, you can't do it together. You're too weak. You're cowards. You believe what we told you to believe. There was plenty of painful truth in that grin. And if as a Negro you gained a tenuous grip on something like prosperity, practicing some profession or owning a business, then why should you endanger what you have worked so hard to get? Status was easy to throw away for those who did not have it. For more or less middle class black folks who had something, there was no need to agitate. They had figured out the rules well enough. They knew that nasty, shit-eating, what-are-you-going-to-do-about-it grin. How could they not? But they managed their ways around it. That managing was nothing to sneer at, yet was pitiful in its way. Their reward wasn't so much half a loaf as a heel no white person wanted. To believe in what white folks claimed was justice opened a person up to being called at best an idealist and at worst naive or even an outright fool. Did Rosa really believe they who had all the power would give in? Was the scenario of rights being claimed and granted just something that made her go, that kept her earnest head busy, but had no connection with reality, as it had been practiced in Montgomery for what felt like time immemorial? Maybe it was true about her being an idealist, a believer in what she was owed, if not in the people who owed it to her. The deeper point was whether all the meetings, workshops, letters, and attempts to register added up to something like momentum or were bound to dissipate like water in a sieve. You see your life run out, so there's nothing in that sieve. It hurts bad. Thank you very much. We have a little time. Um, Elizabeth and I are happy to field questions. If you have anything you'd like to learn about the 20th century, we're here. So, <laughs> modernism or otherwise. So, uh, have any questions about the memoir, what I'm doing? Uh, speak now. <laughs> yes. give, give, give us the background to your project. How did you get into that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, my usual M MO uh, uh, obsession. Uh, these are all people that, you know, one way or another, I was a bit obsessed with, with their, who they were. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a poet, and so um, I am um, a believer in imagination. And I wanted to try to, as I say, get it, the imaginative impact of those lives, basically. What those lives are telling us, the way Elizabeth talked about listening, trying to listen to the story that the lives tell, mm -hmm. and to go beyond the, you know, the simple facts, you know, Rosa Parks stayed on her seat and, you know, things happened. Um, to try to go beyond that, try to get into the imaginative terrain, territory, that was each of these lives. Because to me, each of these lives does really describe a kind of legend that tells us about what was li life was like, you know, for some people in the latter half of the 20th century. So that's, it evolved over a number of years. Um, so I, you know, wrote one and then did other things and wrote another. And then I wound up with 11. So that's how it happened. I'm interested in your statement that when the kids went in that dormitory, they went crazy. Mm 
in a different way. Well, it is. And, and now they're, you know, the black students are very much a part. So it's, um, what's interesting is um, I both love modernism and um, and I'm also happy to live, and I'm glad that I live in a main cave. And there's, it's like finding how to live in a right-sized way. Um, and also explore and go off into exploring the edges, and it's how to find that balance. Remember the, the experiment of open classrooms? Mm -hmm. Or class ones. Yeah. yeah. The kids didn't like it. The teacher, I was a teacher, nobody liked it. People mm -hmm. liked to be you know, your father. Yeah. You're just making me, I love architecture and making me think, why? If, if you're looking, you have the advantage of looking from 2018 back, that actually the, the architecture you identified in the 70s would not have been modernism so much, it would have been more organic and, you know, a lot of wood and that kind of thing. Right. And so it's, and, and then what's interesting to me is, Having grown up through that era, that that you know, I didn't I didn't appreciate mid-century modern the way I do now. I love mid-century modern. I would love to live in a mid-century modern house. And when you look at what's being built with with uh, new materials and efficiency and all that, it harkens a lot more to mid-century modern it now than then. So it's it is it's a really interesting thing to look at the juxtaposition of right. you know. What was what was the style of the time, and and how we kind of circled back to it. Yeah. Um, and and maybe that building was was you know kind of out of its place in time. Yeah. I wonder how you feel or whether you feel the brutalist architects uh, creations were in response to that kind of a thing. Because I'm sure that was not the only modernist building that was assaulted uh, in that era. And then we had the rise of brutalism, which seems to me a response to that. Right, that the, um, ironically, my dad was influenced by um, the early international style of architecture from the 20s and 30s that was influenced by a generation after World War One. So here were these buildings were coming into being built in the 70s, and then the brutalist period was a whole new wave, and it's a long conversation, but it's, um, it's sort of this line in our culture where we keep sort of moving into new places and exploring new ways of being. People found the international style or the 60 modern style too light, and people wanted to ground it, and sort of, the, I think there was that being drawn towards Earth after so much being drawn to the heavens with the early international style. That's good. <coughs> that was a heartwarming uh, and difficult piece that you um, spoke. And um, recalls a very difficult time. And I'm wondering, as you look at um, what your perspective is. I just have been reading about the lynching museum that was put up in Alabama and the Mississippi um, Civil Rights Trail with markers um, telling about what well, this is where Emma Jones beaten to death. And does this, is this a meaningful change or are we still in the same <laughs> um, I think uh, from my own experience as I teach, I'm uh, working with, with young people, um, what I find overwhelmingly is that um, they, they really uh, have, I don't know how to say it, um, racism really isn't part of their baggage. That's really the head of the you know? um, I find a lot of openness. You know, young people. It's really not. It's not there, so to speak. It's obviously still there all over the society. Of course, you know, I mean, history teaches us that um, 
you know, one human lifetime is not exactly the right measurement for anything, really, you know, honestly, you know, for any of this, you know. Um, there's a question, obviously, you know, certain things have changed. Obviously, a lot of the legal things have changed. They're there, you know. Um, other things, of course, haven't changed, you know, because they're deeply ingrained in all kinds of ways that the society ingrains and codifies them, you know, so, so that's my answer. Um, Elizabeth, I'm wondering about, you, you mentioned a few times about the unique way you were educated. Mm -hmm. Did that um, impact the way you parented? And in your memoir, how, how far does it go? Does it go into that? It, it goes into a little bit about, I think it is an extraordinary thing to have a parent share in depth about the world that's really important to them. Because there's a way that, um, if you don't have, there's a way that a lot of kids slip through growing up where they don't get a lot of depth. Um, so that what was most important to my dad was architecture. What was really important to me growing up, or when my kids were growing up, was understanding the world from the perspective of an architecture. And I taught my kids about the, the flow of the elements in Chinese medicine. So that my daughter, by the time she was about 10 or 11, she could really diagnose people energetically. It's like, oh, this person is wood, or this person is fire. And I just, because acupuncture is a lineage tradition that I really experienced, because I understood learning in a lineage. My dad had been an architect, his father had been an architect. So I was brought up in learning through the, through the generation. And I passed on, my kids really got this um, understanding of the elements of nature and how Chinese medicine works. Neither of them have gone into it. My, but my son teaches um, mindfulness in the schools in Boston. My daughter teaches Spanish. But, um, but I passed on what was really important to me and had really tough conversations with her and shared that language. Time to leave the room. Thank you. 